Okay, so we've got the uh, we've got the projector working. Roger's going to get the projector working. So um, Roger's going to talk some more about the Nyquist. First thing, should get out of his way. Hopefully, Sam will be working as well. Okay. Uh, so I, I thought it would be uh, interesting to try to uh, look at some uh, analysis functions that are in Nyquist and uh, running them through Audacity. And uh, basically what I, what I did was I kind of made a, a list of some things that I use often. And uh, I, I actually usually work, uh, when, when I'm doing things with Nyquist, I usually work within Nyquist. So maybe I'll show you what, what I really mean by that. So, so Nyquist, in addition to being uh, the, the scripting plugin language for Audacity is, is also a, a standalone uh, system. Uh, what's happened here? Oh, here it is. So, so <coughs> one, one way to work with Nyquist, and in fact, you know, if I'm developing stuff, I usually use this. So this is a Nyquist IDE. It's uh, pretty separate from Audacity, uh, but you can go and find it online, and it's, it's free to download it. So just uh, so, for example, some, uh, you know, Steve was showing you the OSC function, so we could similarly say play OSC uh, something that, I'm sorry this text is not readable, I'm just typing play OSC C4, which is with C, and uh, let's see, this is probably going to be loud. There we get a tone, and, and uh, I guess the, the major difference between doing it this way and typing plug-in in uh, Audacity is, is here. There's a um, uh, there, there's a built-in editor uh, for Nyquist, and also there's a, a sort of a console output, so you can put lot put debugging statements and, and see what's happening that it gets uh, plotted or uh, printed out over here. But anyway, so that's so that's Nyquist, and I, I use Nyquist for a lot of things, and um, one of those things is doing different kinds of sound analysis. And a very common, sort of straightforward uh, analysis you can do with sound is looking at the how loud sound is. And actually, loudness is a perceptual very complicated because it has to do with the ears and the brain and uh, you know, biology and evolution and where did loudness come from. But a, 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 a substitute for loudness or a simple model of loudness <coughs> is, is called RMS uh, or root mean square. And so for uh, uh, just to um, explain that what's actually going on here very briefly Let's generate um, a tone. So here's a 440 hertz uh, sine tone. Let's, let's get it where we can actually see it. Okay, so it looks like looks like this. If we were to take this and square it, uh, let's go to the Nyquist prompt and oops, I don't know. Let me try this, but this should work. I'm just oh. We use the mult function we saw before to multiply the signal by itself. So that's going to square the signal. And work. Okay, so when you when you square it, the, the whole point of squaring it's not uh, so much to make it, it bigger or to do the multiplication, but to make it positive because you multiply uh, whenever the signal is is positive and you multiply it by itself, you get a positive number. The signal is negative, you multiply it by itself, and you get another positive number. So the, this, uh, let's see. Uh, so in in the uh, before I squared it, uh, the, the negative part of you know part of the signal was negative, it was down here, and after I squared, those negative bits all become positive. So we're sort of seeing here was the the negative peak, the positive peak. It's all positive. So once you do uh, 
uh, once you square the signal, you can, uh, then it makes sense to, to take an average. Uh, and so you, you take an average, and then usually you, you then, because you squared it at the beginning, after you average it, you take the square root again. And, that's, and so that's exactly what RMS is. What does that do for it, to the way it sounds? Uh, well, so, oh, actually it's, it's kind of a frequency doubler. average of this, the average would be zero, so that tells you nothing. And so, okay, so that's, uh, so that's the basis of RMS. And uh, so let's see, go back to my well, so the basic underlying technique is you to basically to define where waypoints you go in terms of size on the screen. Uh, no, so the, the size on the screen is, is based on the, the underlying I mean, it's the actual sample values, oh, right. uh, which are which are allowed to go negative. But uh, when you're going to do those you get the RMS and you get the maximum and minimum. Uh, yeah, is that true? I thought that was uh, this. So, like, when, when you do this, the output is the. Oh, oh, so this is. And then the end is the RMS. This this part is RMS. Yeah. So Interestingly, you can see there, uh, if you just zoom out just a fraction, uh, you can see that the, uh, the RMS level in the short, in that short section as well, and how that's only shown at the top. Yeah, you'd love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the RMS, so, so this, this RMS is actually, this should be the square of this RMS because I squared the signal. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we're all less than one, so every time you square it, that gets, gets small. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. Uh, oh, so let's try.
uh, and, and say it's, you know, it's the true, pure programming form. And it, and there, it's a good argument, but it does end up with a lot of parentheses. And yeah, fun. lots of silly parentheses. Uh, yeah, lists. Uh, I, 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 I think the I think I is for insipid. It's <laughs> lots of insipid, stupid parentheses. Is list was the acronym for. Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Rick Talby, who's at the University of Illinois, was also working with Liz for a long time. And for his students, he developed a sort of a new syntax uh, for Liz that he calls SAL. Uh, SAL is another acronym for something like simple algorithm language, or I don't know what it is, but. Anyway, I, I, I liked it and I thought it would be interesting to try, and so I ported Sal to Liz. And so what we now have is a Sal syntax. So, for example, instead of typing open parenthesis, malt s, oh, you know what else I need to do here? It's not an What? They got me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, instead of typing something like this, I can type. Uh, sorry, that's that's. So Sal has an infix notation, and you, know, you can use multiply operators and plus operators uh, as, as opposed to list. And uh, all right, so anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do things with, with Sal. Uh, all my examples. <coughs> Audacity, you can now, for years, I guess, you've been able to use uh, either Sal or Lisp syntax. So here's the RMS function. Let's just uh, uh, let's run that on this hello. Oh, and uh, here we have an interesting <coughs> thing. I'm not sure whether this is a bug or a feature. Feature. and all to everyone. Uh, what's happened here is RMS um, is constructing sort of a summary of the signal. Um, it's, by default, it's um, looking at a hundredth of a second of audio, which is many, many samples, and averaging, you know, take the square, average them, take the square root, and you get one sample back. So the sample rate is now 100, whereas it was 444. 1 kilohertz. Uh, but Audacity doesn't know that and doesn't do anything about it. So to actually see this, well, there's a couple of things we can do. But one, one thing I can do is just change the, tell it the correct sample rate, which is 100. And so here is the mess uh, of, that, of that cello signal that we saw before. Um, that's what I can do. So it does get the data correctly, it just doesn't display it, right? Yeah, the data's right. The, the display, um, yeah, it's probably a bug. We're not, actually, we're not actually either looking at the sample rate of what comes back or coercing the sample rate to map what I've actually to do. Or should the, like, this return the audio in the sample rate to the project? Uh, yeah, one, 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 yeah. one of the two. We can, we can. Uh, okay, so here's RMS. Another another way we could let me just do undo and go back to here and uh, let's. All right, so the first thing we could do just for convenience is uh, rather than saying return S, I could say force, uh, and this is what we were just talking about. Maybe this should be happening automatically, but anyway, I can say force the sample rate of uh, the signal to be sound S rate. So we'll get the sample rate of the input signal S and we'll put RMS and we'll upsample it to match that. I think this is going to work. Yeah, okay, so now we get it and it displays right the first time. Okay, programming on the fly here. So that's, uh, you know, so that's RMS. And then, so 
so one thing that is kind of interesting to do with, with RMS, uh, very often people use RMS to, try to uh, detect onsets and separate notes. And I think I mean, there, there are some functions in Audacity to a silence detector, um, and that's pretty sure that's on RMS. Uh, one thing that you find is, although it's tempting to think that you can de detect notes with, with RMS, and, and kind of in the simple-minded model of, of music, you know, tones have a beginning and a middle and an ending, and they always start in silence, and then they turn on and they turn off. And so you say, okay, so that's going to be really easy. I just find, especially for just a single instrument, all I need to do is, is find where the signal goes down and comes back up again, and that will tell me where the notes are. Okay, but interestingly, you know, let's, let's look at this one. Okay, so so we look at this, and then I say, okay, you heard this, you heard that cello sound, and where are the notes? And not at all clear. In fact, the really interesting thing is you see these peaks here, and you think that's obviously a bum 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 bunch of notes there. But that's actually the vibrato from cello. If I go back, and play it again. yeah, here's here's where those peaks are. Okay, that was just a single tone. With vibrato. So it's not, um, uh, you know, you have to be careful how you use this. There, there are some appropriate uh, uses and, and some things that just don't work. Um, okay, so we talked about RMS and sample rate. <coughs> oh, okay, so another thing uh, that uh, you can do. I mean, if, if you are trying to detect <coughs> sonic events of some kind, another problem, well, an obvious thing to do is set some kind of threshold and look for when the RMS goes over that threshold. Then the question is, what, how do you set the threshold? And uh, sometimes it's very easy, but many times, uh, you know, sounds get soft and sounds get loud, and so uh, the threshold might change depending on how loud the signal is. So one thing that you can do is make a more dynamic uh, threshold that, that based, that's based on how loud the sound is in the local area. So how loud is the sound in the local area? Well, again, we can use RMS. Uh, so, so what I'm going to show you is some code that uses kind of short-term RMS to get um, more or less instantaneous how loud is the signal within a hundredth of a second? Um, and that's and that's good for for following the, the contour. That's like what this light blue <coughs> RMS contour is based on. But then you can also do RMS on a really long scale, like like one or two seconds. So you can say, okay, what what's the average signal on a, a scale like this? And we can just have a sliding window and and look at. Um, the average across all of these peaks, what's that? And then if we compare those two, the short RMS versus the long couple of seconds average, uh, then instead of using a, just a simple constant threshold, we can say, well, my threshold is going to be whenever the instantaneous or near instantaneous RMS is, you know, 10% higher than the, the local average longer term average, and then I'll, I'll call those the peaks. So that's, that's kind of how this analysis is going to work. Um, I think, well, OK, so we're actually looking at, yeah, so this is a plug-in.
sorry, I'm just trying to uh, some of the issues. Uh, when, when you do this RMS thing, one thing that happens is the, the RMS, the, the, the simple RMS function in Nyquist actually you know, it starts at zero, and you tell it, I'm going to average, uh, I, I'm going to compute every hundredth of a second. So that's 441 samples. So it goes forward 441 samples, grabs them all, squares them all, adds them together, divides by 441, takes the square root. So that's the RMS. And so you end up with a single number <coughs> for this thing that spans 441 samples. So, so then the question is, where do you put that number in time? And uh, the RMS function does the simple-minded thing of assigning that to the <coughs> first sample. So it's actually shifting. I mean, so it's, it's assigning that time to zero, but that, that value at time zero actually applies to from zero to a hundredth of a second in, in the future. So in, in a sense, the, the more, a more natural thing would be to assign the time of that RMS to the middle of the window that you measured. So effectively, you're shifting the, uh, I mean, the RMS <laughs> signal is shifted to the left by half of the window size. And that really makes a difference if you're trying to take the average over, say, one second of sound. Um, you know that <coughs> average gets assigned to the beginning of that window, and, and so I, the the plugin is a lot more complicated than just typing um, RMS because it's it's looking at these sample rates and the window size and computing where uh, it's shifting the resulting signal to make to compensate for that uh, timing error. So that's that's pretty much that. And then uh, let's see. Okay. So so then I started talking about onset detection, figuring out where notes and where events are. And uh, so I've made a uh, I've done that. And let's go back to night audacity. And, oh, you know what? I was looking into the This plugin has a variable window size, so for example, we could go to something you know, pretty, uh, pretty long, and here's the, uh, you could decide how many analyses to do per second, and you can run it. And, okay, so here you see it's gotten much smoother because I set the window size to, to long. Um, so that's, so that's RMS. And then, so the next thing I did was, um, I read this thing called Tap Finder. So the Tap Finder, and this is adapted from a, a class that I teach, and we try to do analysis of sound and, and musical applications of that. So the, the Tap Finder is doing this trick of computing a long-term RMS <coughs> and a short-term RMS, and then looking for places where the short-term RMS exceeds the long-term RMS, and that's indicating a tap or event set of some kind. So if I run the tap finder on this, um, it has some some parameters. It's, it's, it's bigger. Okay. So uh, the first one is how, what's this the factor that you want the peak to rise above the, the local average. And that's set to two. And then um, it and very, very soft sounds where there's just noise, you'll just naturally, I mean, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll naturally see events in noise. And so you might want to have an, an additional kind of noise uh, factor that uh, you, you take the peak and subtract 0.02 or whatever you set down here, and that can eliminate some spurious signals. And, um, and then I think if, uh, oh, so let's, 
let's just run this. And uh, this thing returns a label track. And one thing that you find is with Like with this cello audio, it's not doing anything that makes a lot of sense for the reasons I explained before. That you know, there's uh, there there are not necessarily silences between notes. There are within notes. There are peaks, and so there's no real setting of these parameters that makes a lot of sense. However, um, you know, I, I call this thing tap detect for a reason. That it's really written to detect real taps. And so let's if I uh, Get rid of all this and just record some taps or claps, I guess. Uh, and then uh, we can select all of that and let's see. So we'll do tap minor and that, and let's see what happens. Okay, we get a bunch of labels that are. Uh, oh, this works so well. It's I was going to show you one more little feature, but it, it actually looks like it works uh, perfectly. Okay, so um, so uh, it's pretty pretty quick to you know if you have the right kind of music, uh, drums, clapping, tapping, you know, you just tap on the microphone. It works really well for that. The the one the thing I was going to show you it was the extra feature. taps less than this time delay later. So for so in other words, since I, I know that I I can't really clap uh, probably more than eight or ten times a second at, at the fastest, um, you know, I can set this to uh, uh, 90, 100 milliseconds and just uh, always take the first tap and then ignore everything for the next 90 or 100 milliseconds. And so that, that actually worked really well to filter out the Defects that I have. And, and again, if, if people want to uh, talk about code or look at this more closely, we can put all this code online. I'm not sure where the best place to do it is, and it's not there yet, but we'll, we'll figure something out. And um, feel free to ask about the code. But I kind of feel like most, most of you guys are not Nyquist programmers, so if I start going through uh, all the details, it's just going to um, be too much. Much detail, and we want to have lunch too. So, um, all right. So I'll leave it at that. So that's the tap uh, thing, and then uh, the next thing I, I looked at. So it's you know might be interesting <coughs> in some cases to actually get uh, this uh, tapping timing for these taps. You know, you can. Oh, what happens to my? <coughs>
that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, the, uh, but although there's a trick here, so um, um, yeah, so let me just let me just go on uh, from here. So one thing you, you can do is you can write these labels out to a text file, and you could you could read those in with some other you know spreadsheet or some other program, or you can read them in with Nyquist. And uh, what we're going to do here is I there's a there's sort of a magic variable called scratch where you can put data, where plugins can put data so that when you run another plugin, uh, that plugin can access the data that you've left there. And so this, uh, this analysis actually puts tap data into the scratch variable. And so I've written another uh, plugin uh, called tap drummer. So what, it, what it's done is uh, it's read all of these onset times out of scratch and read a drum sample from the disk and placed it here and multiplied it by the amplitude of this tap, which is also in, in the data. Uh, and and so I think that was randomly picking between a kick drum and a snare drum. Scratch, and, um, and here's a function. Oh, so this is what sound code looks like. That's a good, good reason to put this up here. Uh, so this is this is a function to uh, read a drum sample, and um, let's see. This is a <coughs> uh, function to just randomly choose an element from a list. Uh, I think I was using that to choose. Oh yeah, there are actually multiple drum samples. So what I'm doing is I'm calling choice of kick one, kick two, uh, and you know five different snare sounds. And uh, so I, I make a random choice, and then I read the sample. And it turns out these are stereo, and I was trying to compute mono. So I, this is a way <coughs> reference to just take the left channel, kind of a quick and dirty convert to mono. And uh, here's the score, to, uh, the code to convert from those taps uh, into a score, uh, I'm just looping through the taps and appending the taps to the score, and a uh, few more details there. And then finally, um, in Nyquist, if you have a, uh, there, there's a concept of a score, which is a list of events with functions to call and parameters to pass. And then there's a function called timed sequence, uh, which takes a score as input and turns it into a sound. So the main function here is just uh, we convert taps into score. And we